Hey, there's Sun here, and today I'm going to tell you the history of the Gex character. Now, a lot of people remember Gex fondly for being a great game on the original and much beloved PlayStation, but his true origin lies with a much less loved system. The 3DO, the brainchild of Trip Hawkins, who, as many remember, used to be the president and CEO of Electronic Arts. Gex was released on the 3DO in March 1995. According to Greg Grankman, it was nothing short of 21 months of pure hell for him and the ragtag bunch of programmers and artists that worked on the first game. Gregman was told that Gex would become the next Sonic or Mario, a superstar hit. But unfortunately, that didn't exactly become the case. While Gex is a much-loved character to fans of his games, whether they be here in the States or across the pond in the UK PAL territories, and has earned every bit of his cult classic status to today's modern gamers, Gex is just another forgotten mascot character born in the 90s. Nowhere near the popularity associated with characters like Master Chief, Nathan Drake, and certainly nowhere near the status that Mario or Sonic has achieved. Now, I'm not going to go into the 3DO, but if you're curious about it, you can find all you need to know by going on Wikipedia or Google and typing in 3DO or Trip Hawkins. I would encourage you to read both pages, or just the best page Google can find, as it offers great insight into a time where a system had been released way too far ahead of its time. Now, I won't be playing the first title in the series. I don't like it as much as I love Gex or the Gecko, but I assure you that the only things you need to know from the first game are that Gex got sucked into a TV and eventually defeated Rez and got back to the real world. Unfortunately, much of the actual story's charm didn't make it into the actual game, but it did make it into the manual. The story enclosed in it reads as follows. Ah, Hawaii, a lush, tropical paradise, famous for many things. Magnum P.I., Hawaiian Eye, that TV show starring Jack Lord's hair, and most importantly, the world's largest population of gecko lizards. That's right, geckos. And one family of geckos in particular had a very special problem. Deep in the valley on Maui lived a gecko family that was just trying to make ends meet. Mom had her paws full, raising three and a half kids. Their numbers depended upon their regenerative powers. While Dad was away doing research for NASA, Gex, the oldest offspring, was a bright lad who would spend his days with his friends surfing, playing the ukulele, and throwing poi parties down on the beach with the local lady lizards. That all changed, though, the day Mom got a call from NASA telling her the tragic news. The rocket, containing Dad and ten other volunteers chosen to see if they would eat tapioca pudding in zero gravity, had exploded on the launch pad due to a band-aid floating in one of the fuel tanks. The family's carefree upper-middle-class life was shattered. While the rest of the family dealt with their grief in the usual manner, crying and fighting and rummaging through Dad's stuff, Gex bottled up his feelings. He took refuge in front of the only thing in the house that had always provided him with undemanding comfort. The TV. Gex found that in his time of need, all his old and sometimes forgotten friends were still there, ready to take his mind off his troubles. There was Kimba the White Lion, eager to take him on an adventure through the African savannas. The Six Million Dollar Man would stop by with a quick bionic pick-me-up. The Partridge family would play a song and then shake their heads at the wacky antics of Mr. Reuben Kincaid. These were Gex's true friends, and he was willing to spend the rest of his life in their groovy company. Try as she might, Gex's mom could not pry her son away from the boob tube. So after consulting with the family minister and the weird guy at work, she decided it was time for a change of scenery. They were going to leave Hawaii and start a new life in California. One week later, a moving van pulled up in front of the family's new ranch-style home in Encino, California, surrounded by white picket fences and white supremacists. As the moving men unloaded a crate containing Gex and his beloved TV, his mother exclaimed that she was excited about the family's new beginning. Gex just laughed and told her that was exactly what Maud said to her husband after she went through menopause. 
Gex was still having trouble dealing with Dad's death, but Mom thought she knew just what to do. That day, the doorbell rang, and a burly older lizard came in carrying a basket of treats. He said his name was Harve, and he lived next door and wanted to welcome the new neighbors. As he passed out various chocolate-covered bugs to Gex's siblings, Harve mentioned a little too loudly that he had one spot left on his Saturday all-pro girl watching team, and was wondering if there was someone around to fill it. Gex told him from in front of the TV that Jack Tripper was available, but only if he could get out of the two dates he had made for the same night. Harve seemed a little confused. He whispered something to Mom and then took a seat next to the tuned-out gecko. Then Harv asked Gex straight out if he would like to take that spot on the team. Gex replied that he'd love to, but had promised Bosley that he would watch the Angels for him all week. Harv chuckled and suggested that maybe Gex was watching a little too much TV and needed to get outside. Without taking his eyes off the set, Gex explained that the last time he had gone outside, his dad blew up, surrounded by gallons of burning tapioca. Completely out of ideas, Harve bid Mom an exasperated farewell and left. Now what was a concerned mother to do? The next morning, Gex came running downstairs, expecting to have breakfast with the banana splits as usual, when he froze in his tracks. The TV was gone. This must be some kind of joke. Was it out for repairs? Did someone break in and steal it? Come on, man, this isn't funny. The room began to spin. Gex needed a TV fix. The little suction cups on his hands were beginning to twitch. What the heck was going on? Just then, Mom came to the room. If you're looking for the TV, I gave it away to some gypsies early this morning, she said. She told him that enough was enough, and he needed to start doing things like a normal gecko. Go catch some flies, practice walking up walls, enter a tongue-lashing contest, but for cripe's sake, stop watching TV! Gex couldn't believe this. The one thing in his life that had meaning was gone, and his mom was behind it. Exploding with rage, Gex announced that he was never setting foot inside this TV-less house again, and stormed out the front door. Mom ran after him, begging him to stay, but it was too late. She had done the unthinkable. And this was the result. The next few months were a blur. Gex hooked up with some local punks and spent his days skateboarding to the mall, hanging out in comic stores, and blaring music through his Walkman on a cliff overlooking the city. He slept in a friend's garage and made pocket money doing errands for lazy housewives. His entire existence became one long, aimless haze, with none of his TV friends around to help out. This seemed to be how he would spend the rest of his life, or was it? One day, as he was skateboarding along, talking to his invisible friend, the mayor, life on the streets does things to a gecko. A long, black limo pulled up. Gex was about to have his honor go insult the driver when the rear window rolled down and he saw Mom. Mom told Gex she was so glad to have finally found him because she had fantastic news. Three days after Gex had left, his great-uncle Charlie had kicked the bucket and left his entire estate to the family. The amazing part was that, unbeknownst to the family, Uncle Charlie was the original model for the Izod shirt logo. He had invested his meager modeling salary back into company stock. At the time of his passing into the great beyond, Uncle Charlie's estimated worth was over twenty billion dollars. The family was rich. Shocked out of his mind, Gex jumped in the air, told the mayor he had just been impeached, and hopped into Mom's limo. The hard times were over. He was going to start living life right. For the next few weeks, the entire family went on a mad spending spree, buying houses, cars, local judges, and politicians. Mom purchased 51% ownership in NASA and then fired everybody, sold the rockets to some third-world country, and converted Mission Control into a theme restaurant featuring robotic dancing chimps wearing spacesuits. Gex's siblings said they had always wanted to see Australia, so they bought it. Gex, on the other hand, was not into all the cars, jewels, and other extravagances. He took his share of the fortune, tucked it into his pants pocket, and went for a walk. He walked and walked and walked, wondering what to do with his share. Then it hit him. He would use the cash to fulfill a long-time dream. Exactly one hour later, Gex called his mom down to a restaurant, Space Monkeys, and told her goodbye. He was going back to Hawaii. He was going to buy the biggest house on Maui, fill it with the world's largest TV set and enough food for decades, 
and then seal himself inside. He was going to spend the rest of his life watching all his old TV friends getting into outrageous situations or amazing adventures. Mom wished him the best of luck and then ran off to rewire some faulty chimps. Gex hung up the phone and headed out to build his dream. The rest of the story is summed up beautifully in the following intro from Gex on the PlayStation. It all started so simply. I had just finished my usual morning routine of nude funker size, fired up the Barca lounger, grabbed a quick bite to eat, and prepared to watch some serious tubes. Little did I know, my snack was sent by Red. I don't plan to play the original Gex. I did want to show you some comparison shots, well not really comparison shots, some screenshots from the first game that will basically show you what you're missing. <laughs> um, Gex 1, of course, was the only Gex game to offer a map as can be seen here. There's only like uh, five, maybe six worlds at most, all centered around one category. There's a graveyard section, and uh, there's also a kung fu section, a cartoon section, and a secret sci fi section, and there's a whole bunch more. But uh, I haven't played through enough of the game to show you those. It's uh, it's basically Gex, the Gex you don't love, except it's side scrolling. And there's a uh, there's a score, <laughs> that antiquated method of keeping points. Uh, fly coins are here, something that would not return until Gex Deep Cover Gecko. Uh, Gex can stick to pretty much any wall, unlike Gex 2 and 3. This of course gets kind of, uh, just, just, just kind of game breaking sometimes. Um, there's also these little warp, uh, warp portals that will take you to bonus levels. Speaking of bonus levels, I'm sure everyone is familiar with bonus levels. These bonus levels are a little different. They ask you to complete some mundane task for lives rather than a hidden remote or you know something cool like that so yeah I'm not the best player at the original Gex so for now you're just gonna get uh, Gex 2 <laughs> I might do Gex 1 later but um, I'm, I'm not making any promises. Well, I hope you enjoyed this extremely short look into the origin of Gex. This is Sun, signing off. Thank you for watching.